about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Welcome to this special conversation on Bloomberg Quaint. In just a few moments from now, I'll be speaking with Gautam Singhania, the Chairman and Managing Director of Raymond Industries. Now, Raymond, as you know, is an iconic textiles and apparel brand in India. And it's had a somewhat transformational fiscal year of 2017-18. I say that because this is the year in which its revenue and profit is expected to do much better. You've already seen that reflected in the surge in the share price over the last several months. This was also the year in which a family dispute in the Singhania family broke out in the public. But that seems to have helped Gautam Singhania strengthen his hold over the company and lay out his vision for the next several years. So, in many ways, one might say this could be the next coming or the second coming for Raymond. A brand has to continuously re-evolve itself. Uh, you keep, you know, the only thing that's constant in life is change. And I think every year we are seeing change. Yeah, we are in a different direction when we moved away from just doing fabrics and uh, few apparel items to now a huge range of products that we do. Right. Uh, we, we do from shirts, trousers, chinos, denims, t-shirts, active wear, jackets, uh, sweaters. So we've really opened up the category. And ethnic wear, khadi, today we're launching khadi, uh, huge opportunity. So I think uh, the complete man brand has actually evolved into a complete brand now. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk about many of these segments specifically, but before I do that, uh, the financial performance of the company over FY16, FY17 was, you know, reasonably muted. Um, this year's uh, prospects are much, much better. Uh, both revenue and profit have done, or are expected to do, much, much better on an annual basis. What are the prospects for the next year, the few years after that, the trajectory for your various business segments? Well, I think you've seen the last nine to ten quarters better performance quarter on quarter. And that's really the trajectory we are in. We come from a philosophy where we do the right thing and the results will follow. As you can see, a lot of investment has gone into building the brands, opening up retail stores, product development. That's just a huge, huge thrust in this company. And, you know, all I can give a guidance is positive. Okay. But would you like to put numbers to it in terms of what FY19, 20? I know you have a 2020 vision. What all of these are likely to deliver financially for the company? What it means well, in terms of I, I don't, I don't want to put the numbers. I, I'd rather give you the, the macro picture. Okay. So, yes, you will see growth in all the brands. I think Park Avenue today is growing 30, 35%. Parks is growing in that numbers. Raymond Premium Apparel is growing. Our shirting business is growing. The made to measure is growing. Um, you'll see in the next 40 days, we're doing something extremely unique in the made to measure space. Uh, something that's never been done in the world. Okay. So, uh, very excited about this. So we, we, we are continuously evolving ourselves. At least in the suitings business, which is your conventional business, before you know, you've know uh, you diversified into many different aspects of branded apparel, now the FMCG business, you are what, at about 80% market share in the suitings business? I don't think it's prudent to say that, but we, yes, we do have a dominant market share. You do, right? Uh, how do you, I mean, the responsibility of growing that market lies on you. That is your biggest revenue and profit contributor as well. How do you do that? How do you accomplish that? What is your plan on being able to grow the market? Because that's the only way you'll be able to grow your revenue and profit as well. So, you know, contrary to what we believe that, that there's going to be a natural transition from fabric to apparel, mm. the cost of a apparel is more than the cost of a fabric and stitching it. Number two, the domestic profile of the person is so diverse from north to south to east to west that therein lies the opportunity to sell fabrics. And not only are we seeing our worsted fabric business grow, we're seeing our shirting fabric business grow in cotton. We are seeing linen come up as a very strong category. Mm. So much so where we were just doing a small amount of outsourced linen fabric to going up to setting up a facility to to do linen which is Amravati, right? Which is Amravati. So we, we believe that fabric across the counter will continue to do well. We're seeing a strong growth in that. 
for a large base business, yeah. maybe seven, eight, nine percent, somewhere there. But that will continue to be a strong space to be in. Do you visualize a time, maybe two, three, four, five years down the line, when your apparel business will probably be the same size as your fabrics business? By when do you think that might be accomplished by you? Is that a goal? Surely it will be because the growth rates in the apparel business are far higher than the, uh, but the base is still small. So at some point the lines will intersect. Uh, By maybe, when? Do maybe, you have, have maybe you four or five years, I don't know. Four or five years. Yeah, but you know, we keep evolving ourselves and rechanging our targets, so it could happen sooner. I mean, 12 months ago we didn't put such a thrust on ethnic wear that you're seeing today. Uh, so we really put a thrust on the ethnic wear. This whole new made-to-measure concept that I'm, I'm working on uh, hopefully started mid-May and if that picks up traction, uh, the game could change. In certain segments of the apparel business, you've done very, very well already. In others, you have to yet make a mark in women's wear, in traditional wear. These are all opportunities. Can you talk me through what your plans for each of these segments is? So let's and, take, you know, okay, so let's take Raymond, for example. The Raymond apparel, or Raymond ready-to-wear, is really transcending in the same brand. So I'm not worried about it. Let's take Park Avenue. Park Avenue today is amongst the strongest brands in the ready-made apparel space, growing very strongly. If you take Parks for that matter, it's extremely so, uh, strong in the multi-brand outlets, either doing one or two. And in uh, many, many counters, it is already beating traditional established denim brands as being the number one denim brand in those markets. Okay. or in those outlets. So I think each brand is doing very well in its own space. Branded apparel, if I took the overall, I don't see why it should not grow anything between 20 and 25% a year. Okay, and margins in that segment are not necessarily up to speed, right? I think so that's we, been an area that been, you've been wanting to so work on So we've been on through an investment time. phase, and obviously as you get scale, your margins will come, but we're really, really focused on product, 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 the distribution, etc. I have no no qualms of the margins, I have no issues that the margins will come. So I think, you know, for instance, let me look at your business segments, right? Branded textiles does a margin or will do a margin this year of 14% or more. I'm talking about EBITDA margins. Branded apparels would be 4%. What you call garmenting is about 9%. High value cotton shirting about 10%. The other two businesses are tools and hardware and I, they're not comparable, so I won't get into that. So by when do you expect, let's say, branded apparels to come close to the 8-10% that some of your other fabric clothing businesses are doing? Like I said, quarter on quarter we're seeing the improvement and it's a dynamic situation. Besides that, I think on the list of the many new things you were doing or you are doing and what the prospects for that are, uh, is for instance Khadi. You know, what is the growth potential for that? Uh, how big a business can it become over a period think, of time? I think, you know, we've really embraced Khadi. Uh, the organization has come together to do Khadi. Uh, in fact, today is the launch of the official Khadi collection this evening and uh, I see there's a huge potential. It's a scalable business across the nation sure, or do you think sure it will be a very niche business in sure certain metros? Why? Uh, it, it, in Khadi is an USP from India. An international brand does not offer Khadi. So why can't I take Khadi International? Is it more expensively priced uh, than, no. you know? Uh, no, it's not. There was some talk that you were also likely to be working with Patanjali. Is there any truth to that? Were you exploring any I kind of... It. Yeah. I explored it. I explored it. You know, whenever they do the apparel, we'll obviously be a preferred supplier to them. Okay. Uh, we're already a supplier to the, you know, the Air Force, Navy, Army. So, I mean, if Patanjali is going to launch comments. Uh, I, I did meet Baba Ramdev. There's right. no secret. It, I tweeted about it. All world knows. Yeah, no, so. I know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing like a Swadeshi, Swadeshi tie-up. Okay, so would you, would you, have you had any kind of preliminary conversation with him at but all? Like I said, I have met Baba Will it be fabric? Will he be looking for it's white a, label apparel? How would it's, it work? A, it's an exploratory discussion at this stage. Uh, nothing more than that. But do you think that, you know, Patanjali has had some very interesting success in the traditional FMCG business, right? Uh, is that something that you think might work in the apparel business, in the fabrics business? You know, if it works for him, it works for us. What about the scope for expanding women wear? I mean, that's an area that, again, has been a very niche part of your business. Uh, but for many other uh, large companies comparable to yours in the retail space, uh, women's wear has, you know, sort of grown at gallop speed, uh, you know, versus men's So wear. we, you know, there's that much focus you can divert. So let's talk brand-wise, and, and it's important I explain to you brand-wise. 
in the women brand women's wear is no it's clearly a no because we've done lots of research and the male is very possessive about the brand and the research has shown that he is clearly rebelled to the fact of getting into women's wear under the raven brand it's very closely held by the male in park avenue, park avenue we made an effort uh, so we have a women's wear range it's done well so we started it not so long ago uh, but now that it's doing well i'm i'm, I'm sure you'll see the galloping Okay, but how, what, what, I'm guessing it's a real fractional very small. size of your business Today right it's now, very right? small, it's peanuts. I mean, I don't think our women's wear in totality of the group is more than 50 crores. So what's your vision for how large it can get it's within an the next add -on. three years? It's not a priority for us. It's not a priority? Listen, I mean, at 50 crores, even if I had 20% it's 10 crores. I get it. On a apparel base that I'm doing, if I had 10%, that's significantly more. But if you wanted to dramatically scale your branded apparels business, women's wear would not at some point need to be 30, 40% of that business, no? I think there's huge headroom still in the apparel, men's apparel space. Uh, you might sell, say, 100 shirts. Let me explain to you. If you sell 100 shirts, you might go from 100 to 105 shirts, 110 shirts, and say that you, know, you only have a, a 5 or 10% growth rate there. But we make different types of shirts now. So like you say, linen shirts, cotton shirts, uh, poly cotton, whatever. Then you take product categories. So if you see in the Raymond brand now, we've launched sweaters. Now can sweaters become a 100 crore business? Why not? Uh, we've launched shoes. Can that become a big business? So there are lots of vertical in the men's space that we've still got to explore. Okay, and that will be the priority. That will be the priority over the women's. The women's is growing. Okay. Right. It's a, whilst it looks like an apparel business, it's a completely different business. I want to talk a little bit about the traditional wear uh, that you're introducing and going to be focusing on. Uh, and and it's when I saw it here, it made me rephrase the question I was going to put to you. And which is that you know at least from an advertising and brand perception point of view, brands like Maniawar seem to have stolen a march when it comes to the traditional wedding wear category. What's your strategy in being able to counter that? Will that be uh, a category or a section that you will focus uh, you know considerably so, on? So okay, so since you raise Maniawar, I mean credit to them, they've done very well in the space, but. In any category, is there a place for two or three players? Certainly. So they've created that space. Uh, we're we're getting into that space. Uh, you can already see the product range that we have, and I think there'll be a place for more than one. So it's this is another vertical that we're adding. Ethnic wear has the potential to scale faster. Is there any sort of you know assessment you made in terms of the kind of growth? So we that have our plans, but the, you see. When we when we do something, we want to do the supply chain and everything correct. So you'll always have a couple of years where there'll be slow growth, growth to settle the business. You don't want to overcommit and underdeliver. I mean, it always reminds me of a very famous brand. I remember about 20 years ago, there was a brand that was launched. And it was so good in the advertising, and everybody saw it. I mean, you could not miss it. It was, I thought it was a fantastic brand launch. But two weeks later, it was collapsed because there was no product on the shelf. But ethnic wear has the potential to become a substantial portion of the branded apparel business? Certainly. I mean, if you see Maniawar is doing four, five hundred crores of sales, uh, why can't both of us do a thousand crores of sales? I mean, it, it, that market is there. Even if I take 50% of his market, it's still 250, 300 crores of sales. I'm being very optimistic that I'll take his market, and if he's watching this show, he's not going to be happy me saying that, but that's it. That's yeah, life. but your branded apparel business does what? Roughly about 1,500 crores? Yeah. Altogether. You're saying you can do 400, 500 crores it's a in a year list. or two just from ethnic wear? I never no, said I'm a year saying, or two. I'm trying to I get never said what, a year. You, what you think the scope of the opportunity What I'm trying to say is that when there is a market, uh, you've got to aspire to be at least 30, 40% of the market. Otherwise, let's not waste time. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it will happen in two years, three years, or four years, I don't know. Okay. Because it's only our second season in the space. So we are also learning a lot. All I'm trying to say is that we're very enthused with what's going on. Uh, we're very enthused by the reaction to our collection. We are also developing collections. It's a new business for us. Mm. Okay. So if you said, and you said that in a previous answer, that you were expecting roughly about growth rates of 20 to 22 percent in the branded apparel business, uh, which segments of the business will lead those growth rates? Where do you expect the fastest growths to come in, and which ones will help you restore margins? 
uh, or bring margins any, up Any of the brands, as the scale goes up, the margins will come. Now, Park Avenue today is growing very well. So I would say Park Avenue and Parks are growing really well. Raymond is a large base, but you know the, the apparel is new in this. Park Avenue is a much older apparel player. Color Plus is slightly slower. Ethnics, Khadi, first season. So a mix of these is giving you your 20-25% we should it for growth. I want to ask you what your you know sort of uh, plan for the FMCG was, the FMCG business was, and what the opportunities there are here on. So I'm a shareholder and um, a member on the board. I think the question should really be asked to that management team, uh, to the chairman of that company. But having said that, I think uh, the FMCG space is a very exciting space. Uh, the Park Avenue brand in the FMCG business is doing very well. How can we enhance the product pipeline in that? How can we give more products? There's some very exciting stuff happening there. They're also working on some very high-end perfumes, which I'm personally involved in. Uh, so I think the FMCG space is a good space to be in. We have the whole team there in place now, and uh, we're evaluating how we can, you know, sort of uh, expand our space there. So more products in the in various. So you have to. You need to get more products. So. We have launched a shaving foam. Uh, we're looking at various other products that we can launch. Because under the Park Avenue brand, you want to give the whole gambit of products. Right. Are you planning to bring in a strategic investor in that business at all? No. Not at all. The overseas market will play a big role in strategy. I know that you are in Not several South Asian and Middle Eastern countries in terms so of retail. We have, okay, so. so there are two parts to the overseas market. One is the Middle East and the countries around India where we have our own retail presence. Right. And we do our own Raymond shops, and we sell as Raymond brands, so that's one. The other is international markets, basically three markets, Japan, Europe, America, are the real three big markets, then there are smaller markets. And we're very bullish in that as well, that's why we made the large investment in, in Ethiopia. Ethiopia yeah. and, uh, you know, the more China and America fight, the better it is for us, because uh, Ethiopia is uh, a least developed country, so it, if China becomes more expensive getting there, Ethiopia will be still better off. So You can scale up faster, you want to be, you, you, if, See, if we've things... We've just set up Ethiopia. Ethiopia has not been ready for even a year. It's been about 10 months since Ethiopia's up. The first signs are that it's very encouraging. Ethiopia has also had some political turmoil. Uh, the Prime Minister has changed. So it's a little bit of wait and watch. Uh, we have the facility, we've got manufacturing in Bangalore. It's not that we're wishing away Bangalore, Bangalore's continuing to happen. So we're comfortable for the moment. Already today, we are the fourth largest suit manufacturer in the world. Hmm. So you don't see scaling up Ethiopia as in... Uh, it is a plan, is but a plan. I can't give you a timeline. Uh, distribution strategy, stores, you said 100 new stores, now you're at about 1,000 stores and more in the country, over about 600 cities. Um, how, much, uh, how much more to do in terms of the store strategy? How differently would you need to do it? You have to keep re-evolving yourself. These budget stores that we did this year, we did over 100 in the last financial year. Uh, can we double it this year? Uh, there are different format stores opening, like the style play. Um, there's a new made-to-measure concept I'm working on now. Once it's, it's ready, um, even if I do 10 of those this year, I want to get it ready and see how it works. But it, well, that's a high-ticket item. It's, it's changing the perception. I don't want to talk too much about that and, and sort of let the thunder out yet, but. I'm very excited in designing it. I'm working on it personally. And I can guarantee you one thing, that there is no store like that in the world. Your retail strategy, will it be store heavy? Do you expect for this category to continue to be a big store-led category? Or do you hope that at, at some point, or do you think that at some point, your online presence will start, you know, sort of needing more I attention think more than time. online, it is really your large format stores, your multi-brand outlets. Uh, we've got a big trust in that. Uh, so your, your large format stores uh, are now seeing the range. And slowly we're getting entry into outside our store distribution. So there's coexistence. Online is on, but online is still not very large. 
what, what percentage of your sales do you do online at all? I'm just curious That's to know. I'm trying to understand the retail market. I don't, think, I don't, I don't think even one percent. Apparel is one of the biggest selling categories for all of these large e-commerce players. Yeah, it's all discounted. Flip, Flipkart, it's all Amazon. Discounted. And We're that's not, not a strategy that you would we ever follow. Discount. Why is that? But isn't that where some of the scale is? We don't discount. We, we price correct, but we don't discount. Over the last several years, you, you all have made a concerted effort to get out of many of the non-core businesses. Uh, is there anything that, you know, because there are still two non-core businesses, one might call Show it that. Show me the money. Uh, Show you, me the money. Everything's for sale. We're in the business of generating shareholder value. And you know what? Every business is for sale for a price. Okay. I've, I've never shied away from selling businesses. I've done it for 20 years. Why seven years? So, you know, we're in the business of making money. We're in the business of giving our shareholders a return. And, you know, I'm, I'm the largest shareholder. So the more the money shareholders make, the more I gain. So I'm clearly in the business of creating shareholder value. So both you'd be willing to sell both the tools and hardware and the auto component engineering business? At a price, yes, business. of course. I've demonstrated in the past. Yes, of so course you have. I have no, no qualm. Show me the money. Uh, are you actively seeking buyers? I said, show me the money. Well, I'm not in the <laughs> buying list. I can promise you that. <laughs> but are you actively seeking buyers? Is there any immediate plan to want I to be able to... I won't comment on that. But I'm telling you, we are very focused on creating shareholder value. And we will do whatever it takes to create shareholder value. If you see the stock performance of the last two or three years, You'll understand that. No, of course, I've seen how well the stock is done. Yes. Yeah. So we're very, very focused. I can't comment on speculation, uh, but you know the intent is clear. Part of the shareholder value creation proposal also includes um, developing your no Thane land. I got your question before you asked it. No comments. I, I, I think, allow me to finish it. <laughs> developing the Thane yeah. land. I told you we'll do whatever it takes to create shareholder value. But are you working, planning to do that in joint venture with a development company? Uh, no, because I'm not at liberty to talk at what we're going to do with the land. You know, you spoke of corporate governance, and this is really the last thing I wanted to speak about. I know over the last two, three years, you've put an advisory council in place. But the one thing that I think the conversation has not fully died down on is the rift in the family with regards to, I think, the situation with your father. Now, this um, sort of... I'm not at liberty um, to talk about that. Yeah, but this materialized with regarding a dispute in this very building that we yeah, were talking about. Today, I'm not at liberty to talk about it because of a court order. Okay, but... Does that put this building under dispute is my question. I'm not asking about the individual Whatever family Whatever is going dispute. on is in the public domain. I am not at liberty to talk about this because the court has forbidden me from talking about this. So that episode is done with. Now, after the shareholder meeting, that is a thing of the past. Yeah, but there's... You, in your personal life, it may be a different situation. Yeah. But from the business point from of view, point that's of view. a thing of the past. But it never affected the management of the business. You no, it only came up when the shareholder meeting. Yeah, I mean, it, it did not became affect a... the management of the businesses. It was an issue at the corporate level. But it was not okay. an issue that affected the management of the businesses. No, I, I think in one of the interviews you were quoted as saying that it was only when after the transfer of shares happened were you able to really be able to translate your vision for this company so into action. That is a you know, fact so with, with, you know, I mean... When you are the, eventually when it's your business, like in Marwadi, he said, Dhani Kone. Mm -hmm. It's who is the person who's impacted. And, and then you are able, this is a philosophical question, but then you can take non-political decisions. Okay. The buck stops here. The goods are mine, the bads are mine. And today, I will do whatever it takes. See, I was telling another journalist in another interview on a, on a different light, I've been there and done that. I've been associated with many images in my life, a motor racing driver, a socialite, a party boy, good time Charlie, whatever. I'm OK with it. I have no issue. I have nothing to hide from it. I'm in a phase of my life where I want to make a name, and I want to create a company which is really a legacy that's going to be left back as a national asset. I think Raymond is a national asset. We are only custodians of that. We impact 20, 25 million people a year with our products. We make them feel good. And we have a responsibility. And if you see the amount of change that I have made within, you know, there's no insecurity today for me. Okay. Nobody can take my job. I'm the owner of the company. Nobody can take my job. And I will then take, when, you, when this happens to you, you'll realize that you'll take different decisions. Sure. Which are non-political. And today, I mean, to a great extent, the company is fully professional. 
So we've got a very good advisory board in place. Even a company like our FMCG business, I've stepped off as chairman. There's no insecurity that I have to hold on and be chairman. Mr. Rajiv Bakshi is chairman. We've got outside directors. Right. The company is professionally run. Similarly, within Raymond, if you see, the board is getting restructured all the time. There's so much governance that's come into place. There's so much fresh input that's coming in. And everybody's open to listening. And I'm, I'm only involved as much or as little as I'm required. I have many other things in my life that I'm doing, uh, so I'm actually enjoying myself. I, I don't know if you know, but I'm also on the FIA now, uh, uh, on the World Motorsport Council, so that takes my time. I'm trying to see how I can leverage that to bring business for my group. Okay. And, and it's, there's some very interesting things going on there. So I think in three years, you will, you will see something dramatically different. We're working so. hard at it. In fact, I think when I started by saying this is the second coming of Raymond, what I meant is that for a brand that's really older than most of us are, uh, you know, and one of India's most iconic ones, this does seem to be a new growth phase. Uh, I think and you see it reflected in the share price, you see it reflected in the financials, you see it reflected in, you know, uh, the Gautam Singhania speaking with you, right? Uh, hmm. Who's speaking of the many avatars that he's had yeah. in his life I, and I, what I, it represents I, for him today. You know, there's a place and time in life for everything. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. <laughs> Singhania. You. And all the best with all the future ventures. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.